So we'll dive into this today. Love matters most. There's nothing more important in our lives than love. If you want your life to count, you have to focus it. It's got to be focused. You know, you don't take pictures with your camera out of focus. It won't look good. Life doesn't look good out of focus. Everyone, you know, has to get in focus. Jesus said there are two things that are more valuable in life than anything else. He said it is love, loving God, loving each other. Last week we looked at what I call the great commandment. And we're talking about, we talked about the five definitions of love. If you missed last week, you can get it on CD or you can, you can go to our, 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 uh, our website and you can actually watch that service uh, live or watch it online. One of the verses that we looked at last week, Jesus was asked, what is the most important commandment in the entire Bible? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second most important is similar. Love your neighbor as, your, as you love yourself. Now, if Jesus tells you this is the number one and number two item in the entire Bible, how many thinks that's important? I think it's pretty important. And, and it is. Uh, I want you to circle most important. And then I want you to circle second most important. God said these two things... They matter the most in life. Love for God and love for people. He says if you get these two things, you've got them. When God created you and He put you here on earth, you think about God created all of us and He put us here. Well, why didn't He just take us to heaven then? Because we have been placed here that we learn how to love. We've got to learn how to love. And how many know that relationships are one of the most difficult things in life? Trying to keep them things going right with your spouse and your children and your in-laws and your outlaws and your all that other stuff. It's just tough. It is tough. <clears throat> and so God wants us to work on relationship. Why is relationship so important? That's the only thing going to heaven, folks. I've never seen a hearse pull in a U-Haul with people's stuff in it. Because it's not going. It's not going there. And so the Bible is very clear that God put you here on earth for two things. To learn to love God and learn to love other people. Life is one giant lesson on love. If you don't get it the first go round, you get to go another and another and another. It'd be good to just go ahead and learn it. Because, you know, it's just like a, a child. If they don't learn to love and respect their parents, and their parents don't learn, and learn to love and respect their children, it's like the, the son goes, grows up and goes, well, I tell you, well, I'm tired of my parents telling me what to do. I'm going to go join the Marines. Like the Marines are not going to tell you what to do. And they're not going to be quite as nice about telling you what to do as your mom and daddy was. Or it's like the girl that goes, I tell you what, I'm tired of my mom and daddy telling me what to do. I'm going to go, I'm just going to run off and get married. Well, I got a feeling that that is not going to be quite as easy as the love and the desire to love you as your parents did. But see, if, if one method of relationship building does not work, God will lead you into another. And He'll lead you in another one. And He may lead you to some real people. You know what part of the washing machine gets clothes clean? Agitator. That's right. Who said that? <laughs> Jesse, I was kind of surprised you said that. <laughs> is Chip, is she the agitator in your marriage? Yes. She kind of... <laughs> That's what I thought. Right. Why is it that God puts an agitator around you? Because... He wants Chip to learn how to love. <laughs> and God will put an agitator in your relationships in order that you learn how to love the way God says to love. Because God said love your enemies, love those that despitefully use you. Love, love, love. It's, it's the main thing, folks. That's why I want to point out today, we're going to talk about the priority of love. We, we know love is important, but we sometimes forget it. We get too busy, we get distracted. And so, law number one, the best use of our life is love. I'm going to give you three laws. Law number one, God says you need to make learning how to love your number one priority in life, your primary objective, your greatest ambition, your life purpose. More than anything else, He says you need to learn. You need to learn how to love God, love yourself, and love your neighbor. Why does He say that? Four reasons why love is more important than anything else in life. Number one, love always validates your faith. Love always validates your faith. What does that mean? It proves that you are God's child. 
You know, if you were to go to the White House, you got to have nowadays all kinds of credentials to get in. You got to prove that you are who you are. Your birth certificate. I mean, it's like getting in the country. You know, you got to have certificates and birth certificate and proof, and and you have to have proof because they're not going to let anybody else in. You're not just going to get in easy anymore. And it's it's the same way when we get to heaven. What is going to be the validation point of us getting into heaven? And God's not going to say, you know, uh, hey, show me uh, your diploma or show me, you know. Your, your career. Show me. No, what's going to validate our faith? He said, "You, they will know you're my disciples by your love. How do they know? How does people know that we, we are God people? How do they know that we are hooked up with God, that we're, that we're receiving? He said, they'll know by their love. Love is the validation of our faith. And he tells us this, the Bible says that God looks at your lifestyle and He says, do you love me? Do you love God with all your heart? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? The Bible says, whoever does not, who, whoever does not love does not know God. If you don't love, He says, you don't know God. And it's pretty clear, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. What is He getting to? The more you learn to love, the more you're like God. John 4 and 20, 1 John 4 and 20. If we say we love God, but we hate others, we're liars. That's pretty blunt, pretty simple. For we cannot love God whom we have not seen if we do not love others who we have seen. Love validates my faith. It proves I really am a child of God. Jesus said, if you love me, do my commandments. You know, love, do what I'm telling you to do. Number two, love integrates my life. In other words, it becomes the dominant life principle. Last week I talked about this dominant life principle. You know, some people they make social life their dominant life principle. Some people make uh, church. Some people make sex. Some people make friends their dominant. Some people make uh, finances their dominant life principle. But God says that love must be our dominant life principle. And when we don't, when we're, life is fragmented, like, okay, this is Sunday. I act like a Christian on Sunday. I cuss like a sailor on Monday. There's something fragmented about that. I'm going to act like I love you on Sunday, but I'm going to act like I really normally act on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. You know what's so aggravated about church? And then you invite your friends to church, and then they start going to church with you, and you and your friends hear a message on love, and, and then you have to go to work with those people, and then... You have to act loving all week because you messed up. Now you've got your friends coming to church with you. They're hearing the same thing you're hearing. Because, you know, if you don't have any of your friends here, you can go back to work and you can... They don't know, so you can just act anyway. But that's called a fragmented life. It's fragmented. Your walk is not your talk. Your talk is not your walk. It's not integrated. And, and, and God is wanting our life to be integrated. We, he wants our dominant life principle to be love. You know, some people build their life on success. Some people, like I said, build it around sex, or they build it on hobbies, or they build it on something else. But when tribulations and when problems and the road ends, the emotional earthquakes begin, the financial hurricanes come, all these things of life hit you. And folks, you better have a, a dominant foundation under you, or those are going to wipe you away. They're going to wipe you away. They're going to wipe away friendships that you need. They're going to wipe them away. How I many of you know of a friend relationship that is now not very <coughs> relational because some kind of trial, some kind of tribulation, some kind of trouble has <coughs> destroyed that relationship? Love is more important than anything else. It, it's what ties everything else together. It ties all together. It integrates life. The third thing, love compensates for sin. I love this little section right here. Love compensates for sin. Why? This is really good news when you understand it. It means when I blow it, when I make mistakes, when I sin, when I have faults and I fumble, that God says my first question is not, did you sin? God's question to me is not, did you sin? It's not like, oh my God, did I sin? God's not surprised when I'm sin. I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> But God's never surprised when I say what I say. He's just not. I'm not that good. You're not that good. That we're not going to sin. 
And the, the first question is not, did Dennis sin or did you sin? The first question is, does Dennis or does you love God? Do you love God with all your heart? Do you love God with all your soul? Do you love God with all your understanding? And 1 Peter 4 and 8 says, Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sin. It covers a multitude of sin. Did you know that in, in, the, in the Old Testament, they would kill a lamb and they'd put it on the doorpost and it was to be a covering of sin. You realize as early as in the book of Genesis when, when Noah, he built an ark, he was a faithful servant of God. He, God saw grace in the eyes of Noah. Did that make Noah perfect? Absolutely not. Noah had to be in that stinking ark with all those animals and all his family. You know what the first thing he did when he got out? He got drunk. How many of you feel like getting drunk when you get around some of your family? Just be honest. All right, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. And Noah, he did get drunk in his tent. And his, one of his sons, he comes in. And his son sees him drunk in his tent naked. And his son walks in there and goes, Oh man, you ought to see the old man. He's in here drunk as a skunk, you know. He's, you know, three sheets of the wind. And he's it, just all these. And, and he's kind of making fun of his dad that is drunk and is naked. And did you know he was cursed by God for that? Did you know that we should never expose someone else's sin? Ever. We should never expose someone else's sin. Did you know that Noah's, uh, his other son walked into the tent and he backed in and he covered his father's nakedness? Wasn't that amazing? And, and, and God saw that as a blessed thing. And you go, well, the Bible says if you cover your sins, you'll not prosper. Yeah, that's personally. If you personally, knowing and you're sinning, willfully sinning, and you're covering it up, and you're acting like you know nobody sees it and God don't see it, you're only fooling yourself. And He said, you'll not prosper if you do that. But folks, we need to be such a loving community. The church is often called a covering. You should have the covering of the church. You should have a covering of a small group, a family, some friends. If you mess up, and it's not if you mess up. Let's change that. Let's say when we mess up. Everybody say when. When, when we mess up, we got some friends, a small group that says, hey, we're going to love him anyway. We're going to love her anyway. We all mess up. We're all sinners saved by grace. We need the cover. And he says love covers a multitude of sin. And evidently God wants sin to be covered. And so, I'm going to give you the two meanings of what that really means. First, it means that when you love Jesus Christ and He loves you, it covers all your sins you've ever done or you're ever going to do. Love covers a multitude of sins. He says, I love you so much, I'm willing to go to the cross for you. I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to take the rap for you. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do your time. I'm willing to take your, serve your sentence. I'm willing to pay your debt. Jesus said, I love you this much. I stretched out my arms and I died on the cross for you. That's very good news for us that Jesus' love and Jesus' blood covers all our past, all our present, all our future sins. The Bible says that love of Jesus covers my sin. It's a blanket. It covers it over. You know, God covers it. And you say, God, do you see my sin? No, I don't see it anymore. All I see is the blood of Jesus. He only sees the blood of Jesus. He only sees the covering for a sin. And Jesus come to earth to cover our sin where we can get back in a relationship. The second thing, if you realize that God came all the way to heaven, came to earth, because we were so dysfunctional, and all our relationships were so screwed up and messed up, and, and just this was horrible, that He came to this earth and He died, that our relationships could be better. Our relationship with God, our, our relationship between us and God, our relationship with others. If we can realize that, then that also means the second part of this, love covers a multitude of sin. And it is once I've been forgiven by God, God empowers me to let other people off the hook. Remember the story about this guy, he was forgiven a great huge debt. And Jesus tells this parable, he you know who that is? That's us. We have been forgiven a huge debt, all our past sins, all our present sins, all our sins we've yet not committed. 
And then we walk around like, I'm Mr. and Mrs. Righteous. We've never done anything wrong. I never sin. I'm perfect. And we hold people to a standard that if the truth be known, we're not even keeping because we can't even keep it perfectly. We all sin some way every day, every week. Love covers sin. Did you know something? Real love, when somebody blows it, it doesn't rub it in. It rubs it out. We need friends that will rub it out instead of you know, rubbing in and, 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 you know, and causing these people to look so horrible. I used to go to church that they'd say, okay, we're bringing you up in front of the church and we're going to make you look like a clown and you know, you're, going to, you know, you're going to do all those things. Folks, don't bother the mouse. There really is one in here. I'm sorry to say. I think it may have come in. Was it somebody just stepped on it? <laughs> We've turned into a Pentecostal church over there. <laughs> Roger, step on it. Play it. Somebody catch you take it outside. You've heard it when the squirrel went to church. <laughs> I really think we had some partner work going on this week. They brought in some stuff, and I think it was in that or in some of the wedding uh, supplies. You know how wedding things get stored for a long time, but uh, I haven't seen or any of it here, so it must have come in yesterday in the wedding stuff. Little demon from hell. <laughs> I just wanted to tell y'all before we put up some guy's preacher's leg. <laughs> we went Pentecostal in a hurry. <laughs> the Bible tells a story about King David. And you know, I'm going to tell you the story about King David is, is both comforting and it's both complexing. David was a murderer. Everybody say murderer. And David was an adulterer. Say adulterer. And then the Bible says, God says he was a man after God's own heart. That's complexing to me. It's complexing. But it's also comforting. It's comforting to, comforting to me to know that a person that, that had committed a murder and a person... You know, he had somebody sent in front of the lines to be killed, and, he, and, and, and then he, he, he committed adultery. But you know, the thing is, David, what made him a man after God's own heart? David never, he never led the, the, the thought that he was perfect. David sinned, he, and he, he, he cried out to God, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me my sins. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. And David went, and so we all will sin, but we need to go to the Lord on a regular basis and we need to say, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. And God covers that. You know, God wants us to very quickly admit our sins. What would it be like if, you know, we had that cardboard stories where people walked by here and they go, I used to be a prostitute, now I'm not. You know, <laughs> I used to be a drug addict, now I'm not. I used to be, you know, a bum, and now. I mean, it was it was revealing. I couldn't do nothing but stand back there and cry. Because it was a it was a high mark in our church. Not that we found out we had a bunch of sinners sitting next to us. I kinda already knew that. <laughs> it was that people were willing to say, Hey, I do have a back I do have a past. But more important than my past is I've got a future and my future is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and I'm no longer a sinner and I'm going to heaven. So no matter what the past was, that's the past. I'm a child of the living God. It was an amazing day. It was, it was just, it, it was amazing. But it's comforting to know that we have a God that can forgive us of anything and He wants to forgive us. You know, God, you know, does God use me because, you know, I'm this handsome guy? Probably not. <laughs> does He use me because I'm perfect? No. Does, does, he, does he use your pastor, you know, for any of these things? No. Your pastor, I want to tell you something. I sin a lot. I don't try to, but I actually do. 
I make mistakes. I have weaknesses. I have faults. I have failures. I flub up. And I've got news for you. So do you. I've seen some of you. It's pretty bad. <laughs> it's pretty bad. But God's love and His forgiveness covers it. And it also tells us, if you really get in the frame of understanding that, and you're going to love like God loves, you're going to have to cut some people some slack in your relationships. You're going to have to forgive. And the next 40 days, it's going to be one of the most difficult things that you have to do, is to love like God means you have to forgive like God. You're going to have to forgive like God. You're going to have to let go of the past like God. And it may be difficult on some of you. It may be difficult, but God expects that of us. The fourth thing, love reverberates forever. See, love goes on forever. It's like it echoes through eternity. Love keeps going on. It's the only thing that lasts. The Bible says this, that these three things continue forever. What continues forever? Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. He says the greatest of these is love. It continues on forever and forever and ever. I hate to tell you this, people, but, uh, but you, someday people are going to forget about all the work you ever did. They're going to forget about all your wealth. They're going to forget about all everything else you've ever done. I want to tell you something. One day, all your trophies are going to get thrown in the trash. One day, all your diplomas and badges and report cards and certificates of accomplishments and your gold watch for retirement are all going to be useless. A great thing for me to do is, is to go to the auction, pay the auction. I went there quite a bit. And, and it was amazing. I was just fascinated where these older people would save and save. And, oh, I want to save this little whatnot for my little Mary Ann and my little Susie and, you know, my little Johnny. And they'd save all that stuff. Probably have their house so cluttered up they could probably only walk through their house saving it for their kids when they pass, you know, when they pass on. And you get there to a page auction and you see these kids go, I don't want all that stuff. You know, my house already got a bunch of junk. So uh, let's throw it up there and see if somebody gives 50 cents for it. <laughs> I mean, this is stuff that parents have saved for a lifetime. And kids, to them, it ain't worth 50 cents. Because, see, we somehow think that our children and our families have such an attachment to our stuff. They don't even want our stuff. They really don't want our stuff. They want us. They want us. And so love is the only thing that lasts. Not our junk. Not all those accomplishments. And you know the thing is, I have been by the bedside of a lot of people dying. A lot more people than I want to in a lifetime. And I've stood by their bedside while they died. And I'm going to tell you, I've done it for a long time. I've been in the ministry over 30 years. I'm going to tell you something. I have never, not one time, ever had anybody go... Hey, could you uh, bring me a picture of my Mercedes and let me look at it one time? I've never had anybody say, Will you bring in my diplomas and my certificates and I want to put them up at the hospital because I want to look at them one more time before I check out. I've never, I've never had them ask for their boats, their cars, or pictures of them, or video. I've never, but you know what? I have heard them say, Please tell my mom and my dad and my brother and my sister and my friend. And they may even want to call an old friend and make something right. The only thing that matters when persons draw in their last breath is their relationships and their friends. I've seen it over and over and over. And it, you know, it would be a, a wonderful accomplishment of us in the next 40 days if we realized that and we didn't have to wait until we're drawing our last breath to realize that relationships are the most important things in life. The Bible says life without love is worthless. It's worthless. It's wasted life. The Bible says, no matter what I say or what I believe or what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Why is it then, if that's the case, why is it that we have a hard time making love the primary aim in our life? It's because of business. People stand up here. I did a wedding last night. They stand up here and they look googly eyes in each other's eyes and they tell them they're going to love each other until death of their part and all this stuff. And then if we're not careful... Before we know it, busyness has crowded out all those words we said. It's crowded it out. Number one cause of divorce today is busyness. We get, we get out going trying to buy stuff to impress people we don't even like. We buy stuff we can't afford to impress people we don't even know to try to impress them. And they're not impressed. For whatever you got, there's somebody else got something more than you got. 
It's not important. And we kind of go through life just relationship skimming. We just kind of skim through, hey, hey, how you doing? But we really don't have any close relationships. And, you know, and we just let everything else get in the way of that. One day you're going to stand before God and God in heaven is not going to say, show me all your certificates and your career and how much work you've done. He's going to say, tell me how much you love me. Tell me how much you loved your neighbor. Tell me how much, how many people you loved in your life and you would willing to do anything to get those people to go to heaven with you. Why are we doing these 40 days of love? Because I want the rest of your life to be the best of your life. And the only way it's going to be the best of your life is if you make love your highest aim. The law number two is the best expression of love is time. T-I-M-E. That's how you spell love. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 18, 1, we must show love through action. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You must show love through action. Love is not something you feel. It's something you say. If This, right, this verse right here could, could absolutely solve most marital problems. It absolutely could. It's something you do. We must show love through actions. Actions are, are actions that are sincere, not through empty words, he says. Question, what is the most desired gift of love? You know they say diamonds are a girl's best friend. And they say that. Or chocolate. You know, that's really good. Or flowers. But you know what the most desired and most priceless gift that you can ever give anybody is your time. See, we all have different energy levels. We all have different statuses of wealth. We all have different personalities. But I'm going to tell you where we're all on the exact same playing field. And that's time. We, everyone in this building has the exact same amount of time in a week. I want to tell you something. We have 168 hours a week. You can choose how you use it. As an adult American, you will live an average of 25,550 days. What are you doing with that time? It's amazing to me that people will stay at home and watch reruns of Friends rather than going out and making friends. Why? It's not, it's not strange to me that reality shows have caught on so big. It's because we don't have time to live a reality life, so we watch it on TV. We don't have time to cook, so we watch cooking shows about reality. We don't have time to make friends, so we watch shows about realities of people that are acting like they're friends. Folks, that is not living. That is not life. That is not what life's all about. We need to take some time and, and you know, smell the coffee. And, and, and the thing is, your children need you. They need your time. The most precious thing you can give your wife is your time. The most precious thing you can give your children is your time. <clears throat> it amazes me that you can't be around children. Even my grandchildren, they go, look, 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 Papa, look what I'm doing. Or look, Daddy, look, Daddy, look at what I'm doing. Or look, Mama. And that stays with kids. You'll see some guy score a touchdown or something. And they're, you know, I want to say hey to my mom or my daddy. They never lose that. There's something about wanting to be seen by the people that mean the most to them and that, that, that seeing, that honors, that blesses them. But you know, more than chocolate and more than flowers and more than diamonds, when you give somebody your time, that's the most precious quantity. If I give you a minute of my time, that's a minute I'll never get back. I'll never get it back. If I give you an hour of my time, I'll never get that hour back. There's nothing I can ever do to reproduce that hour. It'll be gone forever. If I give you a day of my time, that day, it, it, that is the, that's the ticks that life is made of. I don't get it back. And so when you give somebody that that's <coughs> most precious, and the most precious thing you have, the, the highest quality, the highest uh, thing you have is time. The Bible says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Dr. Richard Swenson is one of the world's authorities on stress. And, and here's what he wrote. I've come to believe that speed, the speed of our society, is as much the responsibility for the problems of personal and social dysfunction as any other single factor. Virtually all of our relationships are damaged by hurry. We're always in a hurry. Many families are starved to death by velocity. 
We walk fast. We talk fast. We eat fast. We, we come along. i got to be going. I'll see you later. i got to go. i got to go. Chuck Swindoll said, busyness destroys relationships. It substitutes shallow frenzy for deep friendships. It does. It absolutely does. It steals those relationships. The Bible says, no matter what I say or what I do or what I believe, I am bankrupt without love. Ephesians says it this way, live a life filled with love for others. There it is again. Following the example of Christ, who loved you and gave himself as a sacrifice to take away your sins. I want you to circle two things in that, out, in that verse right there. I want you to circle the word love, and I want you to circle the word sacrifice. For see, that's what I was talking about when people come for counseling. They don't realize love is not just words. Love is not flowers and candy and diamonds. Love, if you circle love and draw a line over sacrifice, love is always demonstrated by sacrifice. Jesus loved so much, what did he do? He sacrificed himself on the cross for us. Love means you sacrifice your time to be a better father. Love means you sacrifice your time to be a better, a, a, a better father, a better spouse, a better friend. It takes time. It takes time in every single relationship you have. It takes time. I want to read a poem to you about a, a workaholic father. He said, I have a son who's five years old, a boy so very fine. When I look at him, it seems to me that all the world is mine. But seldom do I ever see my son awake and bright. I only see him when he sleeps. Only, I'm only home at night. When I come home so weary in the darkness after day, my wife then says to me, you should have seen him play. So I stand beside his bed and I look and I ponder there. And I wonder if he's dreaming. Why isn't daddy there? Love in action. Law number three, the best time to love is now. I didn't preach a message about guilt and regret because there's something you can do about everything I'm talking about today. You can learn how to love. And you can learn to love God and you can learn to love yourself and you can learn to love your neighbor and you can learn to turn that love into a sacrifice of time. And you can sacrifice for those you love. The Bible says when it... Whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. Whenever we've got the opportunity, that means now. Use every chance you have for doing good. The Bible says whenever you, you, whenever you, you possibly can, do good to those who need it. Never tell your neighbor to wait until tomorrow if you can help them today. The question is, who do you need to love today? Who do you need to sacrifice for? Who do you need to work out a, 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 a forgiveness with? Who do you need to forgive? And it may be a great, huge sacrifice for you to forgive somebody. But folks, you only have to think about Jesus loved you while you were yet a sinner. I'm trying to tell you this because I want you to end your life with no regrets. Absolutely no regrets. In 1972, the election of George McGovern was running. He was running against Richard Nixon. And McGovern and Charles Colson were on opposite sides of the political spectrum. But they both ended up with the same kind of regrets. Chuck Colson wrote this. I think back on my life, my biggest regret is not spending more time with my kids. Making, making family your top priority means going against a culture where materialism and workaholism are rampant. It means realizing that you may not advance as fast in your career as others do. It means being willing to accept a lower standard of living knowing that you're doing what is right for your kids. It means giving them the emotional security they'll draw on for the rest of their life. When you look in a child's eye and you spend time and you give them quality attention, that builds their self-worth. And they're not out here sleeping with anybody and doing anything because they have self-worth. Also, George McGovern, one time president candidate, wrote a book about his daughter Terry who died in 1994. She was an alcoholic. They found her frozen to death in a snowdrift in a drunken stupor. After his daughter died, George McGovern poured over her diaries and contacted many of her friends and discovered that he hadn't been the parent that he thought he was. While he was reading her diaries, he discovered this. While he was spending 18 hours a day working for political causes, Terry was writing in her diary how much she missed her daddy and that it, he probably didn't care about her anyway. McGovern's message to parents. 
Show more love to your kids by spending more time with them, especially as teenagers. No matter what it costs your career, that way, he said, neither of you will have regrets. Then he left a quote. He said, I'd give everything I have, I mean everything, for one more afternoon with Terry. Just to let her know how much I love her and to have one more of those happy times we used to have so infrequently. Friends, the question is not whether we're ever going to regret living an overloaded life. The question is when. When you're sitting at old age in your fancy house with your fancy stuff that they're going to sell for 50 cents in the auction and your kids never come around, you're going to be set in your old age saying, I made it, but it don't matter. They've got a book out now on anorexia. The title of the book is Starving for Attention. There's children that are literally starving for attention, so they're starving themselves physically as well. For those in the school system, my wife is, and she deals with children every day. They act out every day. And I think about every time I hear of a child acting out and the discipline that has to be, I think about where, where is the love? Where is the tension? Where is the family? You ask yourself, is the child acting out because it's starving for attention? And I tell you, I, I didn't leave you here today with a guilt or regrets. I'm trying to keep you from having guilt and regret. I'm saying now is the time to do something about it. Now is the time to do something about it. If we would spend more time with our children when they're young, we'd have less work to do when they're teenagers. And if we do more work when they're teenagers, we'd have less to do when they get married and their marriages are falling apart. And some of us are the byproduct of parents maybe that didn't spend a whole lot of time with you. I had wonderful parents, and I can't hardly relate to that, but I, I counsel people, and I hear the stories of they never saw a functional day in their family their whole life. Folks, God loves you, and you can be a part of this church family, and we'll try to love you unconditionally. I want us to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today, if there be one here today that don't know you as a personal Savior, what a day to meet the Father. What a day to get to know their brothers and sisters. And Lord, next week as we fellowship with this fellowship meal, and we're wearing name tags, let us get to know our brothers and sisters. Let us get to know our Father and our big brother Jesus. And Lord, you said love is the main thing. I pray that it will be the main thing in all of our lives. And Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, to Lord, I'm asking you to help me be a better father and a better husband. And Lord, the capacity and my ability to love I want to be a better pastor. I want to be a better lover in life. I want, to, I want to make relationships my highest goal in life. That's all we're going to take out of here anyway. The more people that we can win to our relationships and win to Christ, that's all that's going to happen. And God, I pray that you'd help us do that in the next 40 days. In if you're going to be a live one, you're Listen. welcome to come uh, next Sunday. We'll start the dinner at 12, and then at 12, around 12.30, 101 will begin. God bless you. Have a great day. If you'd like to give this ministry, get an offering boxes in the back of the lobby. Have a great day.